Welcome, my name is Dr. George Sparks and you are watching Bible Interact TV. Today I'm going to share with you something that I feel is exciting. Many people collect lighthouses, little model lighthouses, over the hundreds of varieties to choose from. I think one in particular stands out the most, and it is called the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandria. It was built over 2,300 years ago, and it stood for almost 1,500 years before it was actually destroyed by earthquakes. That's what I'd like to share with you today, so stick with me and let's have some fun. The story of the Pharaohs starts with the founding of the city of Alexandria by the Macedonian conqueror Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Alexander started at least 17 cities named after himself, Alexandria, at different locations in his vast domain. Most of them disappeared, but Alexandria in Egypt thrived for many centuries, and it is even prosperous today. Alexander himself died in 323 BC, and the city was completed by his predecessor, Ptolemy Soster, the new ruler of Egypt. Ptolemy authorized the building of Pharaohs in 290 BC, and then when it was completed some 20 years later, it was the first lighthouse in the world and the tallest building in existence except for the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Both of these ancient man-made constructions were not passed in height into the building of the Eiffel Tower in 1887. We have two pictures, the, the pyramids of Giza, I'm sure you're familiar with, and also the uh, Eiffel Tower. And remember, the pyramids were probably about 400 feet high. The Lighthouse of Alexandria, sometimes called the Pharos of Alexandria, was a lighthouse built by the Ptolemaic Kingdom and stood between ancient records, say, 394 to 449 feet tall. And those do vary in ancient records. But it's basically also listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was one of the longest surviving ancient wonders after the Great Pyramids, which still stand, until 1480, when the last of the remnant stones were used to build a citadel, or actually a fortress, on that exact location and site. There were three stages, each built on top of one another. The building material was stone-faced with white marble blocks cemented together with lead mortar. The lowest level of the building, which sat on a 20-foot high stone platform, was probably about 240 feet high and 100 feet square at base, shaped like a massive box. The door to the section of the building wasn't at the bottom of the structure, but part way up, and it, reached a, and it was reached by a 600-foot ramp supported by massive arches. Inside this portion of the structure was a large spiral ramp that allowed materials to be pulled to the top using animal-drawn carts. Here's another picture of an artist's reconstruction of the Lighthouse of Alexandria. This was a mausoleum built representing the lighthouse. A more modern representation showing you different levels and the statues surrounding the lighthouse as well as a statue of Poseidon at the very apex of the structure. On the top of the first section was an eight-sided tower which is probably about 115 feet in height. On the top of the tower was a cylinder that extended up another 60 feet where the fire that provided the light burned. On the roof was a large statue, probably the god of the sea, Poseidon. Here we have a few coins, the lighthouse coin of Alexandria from the second century AD. So at this time, the lighthouse has already stood for 500 years before these coins were actually struck. The first one, Antonian Pius, and the second one, Commodus. Um, I was hoping to actually bring that coin of Commodus here to show you um, a very good example of it, I think just as good as the quality in the picture. However, I couldn't uh, get it, but if you stay with the program, I'm going to share with you some really nice uh, 
artifacts at the end. Close up of some of the ancient coins of Pharaohs. Here you can see the statues at the different levels, especially possibly one of Poseidon at the top. And also we have mosaic representations. This one from the fourth century AD. Once again, you can see the god Poseidon at the top along with another statue. And the second one of a mosaic, as you can see the different levels of the uh, lighthouse. Of course, the largest is at the bottom, supporting the others like a, like a birthday cake, if you will. This last one right here is a lantern. A lantern isn't a lamp. It actually holds the lamp. So that opening that you see, the very large square opening, is where they would place the lamp. The little holes around it, perforating the terracotta, were there to let uh, air flow through it, but not too much as if to put out the light of the lamp, which would be inside. The very t uh, hole at the top of the lamp, or this lantern, was used so was there so it could be actually hung when it was being used. The interior of the upper two sections had a shaft with a dumbwaiter that was used to transport fuel up to the fire. The staircases allowed visitors and the keepers to climb to the beacon chamber at the top. There, according to reports, a large curved mirror, perhaps made of polished bronze, was used to project the fire into a beam. So it's a fire light projected into a beam of light. It was said that ships could detect the light from the tower at night or the smoke from the fire during the day up to 100 miles away. That's probably greatly exaggerated. Other historians such as Josephus stated that it could be seen about 35 miles. Other historians mentioned 50 miles. And also the historian Josephus states that the uh, Jewish Septuagint was actually written on the island of Pharos. We have that tradition as well. An ancient bronze lamp. Here we have a lamp. I'm going to show you another one um, in the artifacts today. A mirror of the ancient world, which is usually metal but was highly polished. Another form of a mirror was mercury that was actually used or implanted behind glass. Um, if you're familiar with some of the uh, Roman traditions of gods, we have one which was the uh, Narcissus. And the Narcissus was actually viewing himself into a pool of water, but also holding a mirror. So a mirror is, could be also used as a symbol, sometimes, of vanity. Here we have another artifact of a mirror. This is actually like a compact. You've got two handles, and then it opens up, so you have a place to hold it. Of course, a female, some makeup on one side, but, and then a polished mirror on the other. So it's kind of like a, what we would say today, uh, an ancient compact case. The lighthouse was apparently used also as a tourist attraction. Food was sold to visitors, visitors at the observation platform at the top of the first level. A smaller balcony provided an outlook from the top of the eight-sided tower for those that wanted to climb or make the additional climb. The view from there must have been spectacular, seeing that it might have been as high as 300 feet above the sea level. So how was the lighthouse of Alexander actually destroyed? So the destruction. How then did the world's first lighthouse end up at the floor of the Mediterranean Sea? Most accounts indicate that it, like many other ancient buildings, was the victim of earthquakes. It stood for 1,500 years, apparently surviving a tsunami that hit the, uh, the eastern Mediterranean in 365 AD with only minor damage. After that, however, tremors might have been responsible for cracks that appeared at the structure at the end of the 10th century and required restoration that lowered the height of the building by as much as 70 feet. Then in 1303 AD, a major earthquake shook the region that put Pharaohs permanently out of business. Egyptian records indicate that the final collapse occurred in 1375, though ruins remained on the site for some time until around 1480, when much of the building's stones were used to construct a fortress or citadel on the island's exact site where the lighthouse once stood. Here we have pictures of the citadel 
and fortress used from the stones of the Alexandria Lighthouse. In 1994, French archaeologists discovered some remains of the lighthouse on the floor of Alexandria's eastern harbor. The Ministry of the State of Antiquities in Egypt has planned as late as 2015 to turn the submerged ruins of the ancient Alexandria, including those of Pharos, into an underwater museum. Wouldn't that be kind of nice for a trip if you took classes in um, scuba diving and you also visited uh, the remains of Pharos where the citadel stood and then you went out into the harbor, which I think is possibly only like 30, maybe 60 feet deep at the max. So that's not that far down to uh, actually scuba dive and see the ancient remains of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I think that would be pretty fantastic. Here we have a underwater archaeologist and he is looking at an ancient sphinx. One thing we found out also about some of the structures uh, being uncovered in the harbor um, was that they moved some ancient Egyptian, you can say, statues uh, around Pharaoh's, the lighthouse, for decoration. So the, um, sometimes, such as the Sphinx and other monuments were much, much older than the lighthouse, but they were actually moved there to uh, decorate the lighthouse for cosmetic purposes, maybe to make it look more Egyptian. Here, once again, an underwater view. You can see a scuba diver in the background and possibly some ancient columns. Looks like he's scuba diving around a, uh, a giant chess set. Like, those look like little palms. And then we have some blocks. Uh, the block in the center facing up you can see a little um, ridge around the outside of the stone, and we call that a boss, where they finish it down. It's supposed to be a type of decoration, boss, B-O-S-S. -S. So around the stone is a boss. So if you ever hear that uh, term used, this is what they're talking about, and this is what it's used, uh, how it's being seen. Uh, other stones, you can see the long stones, depending on where they are placed in a structure, whether they're placed long ways facing towards you, so you got the narrow end of the stone facing towards you, and then if they're uh, in, uh, facing towards you, but you're seeing the length of the stone, we got two terminologies for that. If you can see just the front part of the stone, the narrow part of the stone, if you will, that's called the header. And then if you see the length of the stone, that's called the stretcher, so just think of stretch. The top of the stone facing towards you, header. The length of the stone, a stretcher, the decoration around the stone is called a boss. Here we have a column facing towards you. Once again, you can see scuba divers, scuba divers in the background at this uh, vast underwater, today, an underwater museum. So right now, if you would, you join me over at some of the artifacts that I have sitting out, dating from the Greek period and also the Hellenistic period and Roman period. So we can date them probably around 500, Hellenistic period, 300, Roman period, 100 to around 200, and also the Byzantine period, so 600 AD. So let's go over to the, uh, the room of a thousand artifacts and I'll show you what we have. This vessel, first vessel that I have is actually called a Lucky Toast. It's possibly used to store perfume. You can see this checkerboard display right here, design, very, very common artistic design in the ancient world. The type of base that we have. It's kind of an odd base. It's not really what I would call a ring base, but it's not really a flat base, and it's not really a fluted base, so we just, just call it a, a different base. Uh, but this is a base on what we call a lucky toast. What they would use for a stopper, maybe a stone, a cork, cloth, And here we have a drinking cup. The handles are on the top. So this is what we would call a skyphos. On both sides is a picture of an owl. Probably representing the goddess Athena. And then on the base, we do have a ring base here. Once again, 
What is a ring base? Well, if I would wet this, slightly wet it, make it moist, and lay it down on a cloth, let it sit, pick it up, and you picked up the cloth, you would see a ring. So this means a ring base. If it was completely flat, if we put some moisture on it and laid it down on a cloth and picked up the cloth, you would see a big uh, circular structure. And this would be called a flat base. We could say a flat ring base, but so we got a ring base, and then you could have a flat base. This comes from the Hellenistic period. So beginning with Alexander the Great. So we're dating this to at least the third century BC. This would be used to store perfume. It has what we call black slip on it, used for decoration. Over the black slip, we have these different types of ring designs. Black, and it looks like maybe at one time white, but however, right now it looks gray. But for the type of artifact that you're seeing here is called a spindle bottle. Looks like a little spindle bottle, right? And here we have a flat base. Can you see the flat base? So once again, if I wet this and lay it down on a piece of paper and pick it up, you're going to see a little flat disc. If I had wet this particular Skyphos and laid it down on a piece of paper, picked up the paper, you would see a ring, a ring base. What is this one? We called it a different base, meaning I'm not sure. All right, now let's look at some Hellenistic um, plates. Usually Hellenistic plates are, um, I would say, actually kind of like poorly made in some common instances. I mean, the, the common pottery used is not really spectacular. Here we have a red slip, but on the back of it, it looks like it's either a black slip or it's just been burned, okay? But if you look at the slip itself, you can see where it just looks like it's been dipped. It looks like it's just run over this thing. It looks like it has drip marks. So it's not that well designed. So maybe because it's common, they would just dip it in uh, a stain or a slip and let it dry or drip dry. And, this is, the, uh, this is the design from that period. However, if you can see the sides of this vessel, I'll hold it like this here. You can see a curvature. The curvature is made on the potter's wheel, and we call this carination. A carinated vessel means it's curved, and it's going to have different types of curvatures. Usually around, you can say, the midsection of the vessel, you'll see the curvature, whether it be a bowl, or maybe some type of uh, dipper juglet. Okay, I'll show you another plate, very common to what we might have today. Once again, if you look right here, you'll see how it's red. You can see the slip, but down here, the slip is missing, like it was just dipped, set out to dry, and that's it. If you look very carefully, you can see where it's actually been spun on the potter's wheel. You can see the potter's marks over here. You can see the different wheel indications. This shows up uh, pretty much in the Hellenistic period, you see these imprints where they were pressing down on the clay. It shows up even more. It's thicker and deeper during the uh, Herodian period, the Roman period. And then we get to the Byzantine period, these striations in the pottery where the wheel marks, where they're pressing down the clay, is even thicker and harder in the uh, Byzantine period. Once again, let's flip this over. A ring base. A ring base. The red color is called the slip. And because of the design and the way that uh, it's presented, in other words, it's, it's just not that well made, it's very good indication that this is, of course, the Hellenistic period. Okay, now we'll put these two together, the slip, the darkness of the slip, possibly where it was burned. Also, the uh, potter's marks where they were pressing down the clay where it was spun on the wheel, and also a ring base. So here it's easier to see. In the center, you can see a depression possibly used to hold a cup, a saucer and a cup. This one really doesn't have a carinated design on it like we would see with the smaller vessel. However, it does have a ring base. But this one's kind of cool just because it does have that little center place where you can put your cup if you like. These are two different periods, so I'll be cheating. So something like that. 
It would be neat to have the cup that went with it, though. That'd be, that would be a nice display. So we could put these dishes on top, stack them, Hellenistic period with the spindle bottle on the top. Now let's look at something else. Uh, in the lecture of Pharaoh's Lighthouse, I mentioned that the uh, light was projected into a beam by, it had to be extremely large, a uh, piece of polished bronze, polished bronze. So we didn't have mirrors like you have today, which really gave you a good reflection of yourself. In the New Testament, I believe it's the Apostle Paul that says, and it's just a short phrase, we dimly look into a mirror. So when it says we dimly look into a mirror, sometimes we think uh, of ourselves in a contemporary situation, looking into a, a contemporary mirror, which gives a good reflection. But you can see by the mirrors of the ancient culture that you got to maintain a very highly polished surface to give any type of reflection. Now this is a bronze mirror, but it has silver plating. It might have had some kind of cover on it, a place that you would place the box. They found, I think it was in a book called The Cave of Letters, written by Yagel Yadin. Uh, in the Cave of Letters, they found um, uh, a lamp, but the lamp was also in a box. It was a very decorative box. But understand, it's going to take a lot of polishing. And in a, a human, hum, humid environment, right, this would tint over pretty quickly. So they probably kept it in a box and handled it just by the, you could say this end piece right here, which would have had a handle attached. So a wood handle has since deteriorated and rotted off. So you got to think of this as actually having a thicker handle attached to it, highly polished. And this is a small lamp. I've seen them probably about four times the size. But this is very similar. Uh, to the lamp that was excavated in the Cave of Letters. The book is out of print, but I'm sure you could Amazon or Google it and say Cave of Letters. It's an easy read. It's an easy read. Nice pictures from that time period. I think it's dated to the 1970s or 80s. But an ancient lamp. And this dates to the Roman period. The Roman period. So let's go back over some times just by looking at them. Once you get an eye for pottery, you can pretty much tell what time period you're in. So this is more of your ancient Greeks. Not the time of Alexander the Great, a little bit further back. All right? And it's called a lucky toast. A lucky toast. Used for storing possibly perfumes. A vessel for drinking. The handles are on the top. Think of high. And it's called skyphos. A skyphos. Now we're into the time of Alexander the Great. I only have a few pieces, of course. This is, and these are common from that period. And it's good to know the common pottery because if you're at an excavation or maybe you bump into a tomb, that's what you're possibly going to find. Common pottery. So you want to know your lamps, your different shapes and sizes and decorations of lamps. Once you get an eye for lamps, you can pretty much generally broadly date that, that uh, archaeological time period. And then common pieces like the spindle bottle. If you saw this, you say instantly, Hellenistic period. And then once again, these types of vessels. Carinated design. Carinated, remember, means curvature. Ring base. You look at it and say, but the, uh, the slip on it, the tint, the red slip, with a dark tint on the bottom, and it looks like it's, looked like somebody just dipped it in this, in a dried, Kind of like you're drying dishes on, you know, like on a rack and you just left it there and you think, like, you know, that's not that impressive. Hellenistic period. Although Hellenistic period as well as the Greek period, when you want to look at some fine pottery, that's there as well. Okay? Then we get to the Roman period. And once again, if you want to uh, look at an archaeological dig on record where they find, uh, I'm going to give you another uh, archaeological terminology, in situ. If they say in situ, I uh, S-I-T-A, in situ, or I-S-I-T-U, um, means the place of its origin. In other words, they're going to photograph it, and you're going to see it uh, where it is as they have located it. So it's not moved. It didn't come from an antiquity dealer. 
Now you're going to see it as it was in the excavation, in situ. So if you want to see a lamp that was found in situ by a very popular Israeli archaeologist and general, Yagel Yadin, look up the book. Get it. It's probably just maybe a couple bucks. Uh, the, the Cave of Letters. The Cave of Letters. So here we have, once again, a silver lamp. Bronze overlaid with silver, put it that way. Very cool, though. Very cool. And we got a little bit over a minute left, and I left the best for last from the Byzantine period, 4th century. Remember that the Lighthouse of Alexandria existed for some 1,500 years. Here is a Roman, excuse, yeah, Roman period, Byzantine, Byzantine period, bronze lamp. You can see a fish's tail. You can see the cross. Ah, obviously Christian, right? But look in the center. This is the handle. Well, this is the lid right here. You would put the spout. Put the spout, probably like a little wick of cloth, goes here. Hopefully you can see that. Here's the lid. We open it up, and you can put your oil. You can see the centerpiece. It looks like a piece sticking up. That's where it actually fits into the lamp stand. So this is all made of bronze. Extremely rare. This is a very unique experience to handle this. A bronze lamp alone can be a very cool experience. A bronze lamp with a stand, even cooler. But look at this. What's in the center of it? A lighthouse. The lighthouse, possibly of Alexander, if you can see, where it has these little one, two, three, four, five, six. It has six sides in the, you can say, at the, a, top or a higher structure to the lighthouse over the base, possibly re, uh, representing the eight-sided structure, but it does represent it hexagon instead of an octagon shape, and the lighthouse beacon on the top. Isn't that cool? Kind of goes with the theme, you are the light of the world, except a city on a hill could not be hid, but yet it's represented in an ancient oil lamp, bronze oil lamp. My name is Dr. George Sparks. It's been a privilege. Thank you for your time. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God. At BibleInteract.tv, you will penetrate the scriptures of the Bible. At our store, you're just one click away from owning your favorite books, DVDs, or study guides. Earn a degree from our university and watch hundreds of video presentations from biblical scholars, archaeologists, and theologians. By subscribing to Bible Interact, you'll find all the resources you'll need. So why not subscribe today? Go to www.BibleInteract.tv. You'll be glad you did. Interested in studying more about the temple, the Messiah, or what God's plan is for our future? No problem, we've got you covered. With more than 200 DVDs, books, and workbooks, you'll find the answers you've been searching for. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God.